Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes made of ticky tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they came out all the same. And there's doctors and lawyers and business executives and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And they all play on the golf course and drink their martinis dry and they all have pretty children and the children go to school and the children go to summer camp and then to the university where they are put in boxes and they come out all the same. And the boys go into business and marry and raise a family in boxes made of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. There's a pink one and a green one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. United States we are hearing you know till very recently the big talk was about you know growing population we will be growing in numbers and we'll have a lot of immigration and still our birth rate is much better than mm -hmm. anything in Europe but now we are hearing other things that there may be some sort of stagnation in, mm -hmm. in the population growth or a kind of a tipping off yeah. right, a tipping point also, uh, yes. probably mid mid-century but in general in the United States is uh, and the view is that the population will be growing and we will have to put it somewhere, yeah. <laughs> this growth. Yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, the unfortunate thing is that in the, last, uh, in the last decades, maybe five, six decades, we have been, you know, doing uh, not the best way of uh, growing. Yeah. And um, we have transformed, you know, our places, our cities, our towns into... Uh, into places uh, for the cars, as you yeah. said. It, it's, uh, unfortunate we have been exporting this model. We work uh, around the world and we see the same, uh, the same pattern in uh, Eastern yeah. Europe, in uh, the Middle East, in Canada, in South America, yeah, yeah, in, all, in China, in all places which are growing fast. These are, the, uh, these are the models we have. And unfortunately what we hear very often, we hear um, and we tell them, you know, how, why are you doing, uh, why are you repeating our mistakes? Yeah. Well, it worked for the Americans for quite a while, so we want to, <laughs> yeah, we it will work thing. for us, it will work for us as well. Yeah. The thing was that in the past uh, 20 years, for example, you know, um, especially the last decade in the United States, it was the booming times when we had the great economy mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. everything was selling, so, you know, expanding beyond uh, the reasonable yeah. <laughs> distances was a kind of something which everybody was doing and the municipalities and the cities thought that this will be very positive yeah. uh, for their growth, you know, that they will be growing and the uh, tax revenues will be much higher and growth is the answer to everything. Yeah. It was, uh, and everything was selling till we hit uh, this uh, big... <laughs> Crash, this yes. a big crash a few years ago, which was a, a little bit like a wake-up call. The exciting thing today is that, uh, you know, the transition which we have witnessed before, which started after the Second World War, the transition to from, you know, places for people towards places for cars mm -hmm. is now backwards. It's now the opposite transition. Now people are saying, oh, now our cities, our villages, our suburbs are all about cars, now we want to return back to a pedestrian friendly mm -hmm. and more, you know, people centered yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. So it's like we are witnessing this transition. And um, the thing is that sprawl, you know, as we call this type of development where it's everything is dependent on the cars, mm. um, has been very aggressively supported. It has mm -hmm. been supported by the uh, public sector, 
you know, by the yeah. government, you know, building the highway system, the yeah. interstate system, um, being supported by uh, the way the mortgage uh, framework uh, was working uh, in the United States. Um, a lot of subsidies were put into, uh, into developing the infrastructure for this new growth, you know, with the thinking, mm -hmm. oh, we need to grow. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, national security was based to a certain extent. During the Cold War, mm -hmm. the idea was that dispersing the population actually will protect yeah. the population from, you know, uh, attacks, you know, concentra in concentrated uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, areas. So it was part of a bigger strategy. Mm -hmm. And now we are rethinking this. That this dispersal actually makes us much less resilient to changes in the price of energy, mm -hmm. we're dependent on foreign oil, etc., etc. Yeah. Um, and um, so, you know, this is one of the one of the big drivers of this whole transition, uh, the economic driver. You know, basically, we cannot afford sprawl anymore. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. We just need to go back to uh, building the way we used to build, more in a more compact and more pedestrian friendly way. Uh, there is a new, and it's worldwide, including in the United States, there is a new understanding about the environment. People understand the environment in a different way. Uh, you know, they understand that sprawling, you know, and basically gobbling up uh, open space and water resources and all kinds of natural assets is basically not good for the planet. Or one thing or another understanding is about our health, it's about our well-being, about mm -hmm. how we age as human mm -hmm. beings. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is a different type of understanding. You know, we can be healthy if we move more, if we walk more. And it's just, this is such a common sense. But now we are realizing that the lifestyles we were leading for so long, you know, dependent on cars and not doing our daily activities in a normal way, walking to places. Mm. including our kids, they don't walk to school anymore. Yeah. At least in the United States, you know, 50 years ago, 60-70% of all kids walk to school and today, you know, less than 10%. If you're an older person and you cannot drive, how do you manage in, uh, in a sprawling subdivision, let's say, which is only residential, like a residential bedroom uh, community enclave, and you cannot go anywhere. <laughs> you have to be driven in a car, you know, maybe shuttled to a mall, uh, and in the mall you can walk, you know, it's a kind of a protected and nice environment. Actually, it's um, looking like a real street. <laughs> if you think about it in, in America, and I often, you know, make this comparison, that probably the best public space in American suburbia is the interior of the mall, of the shopping mall. Mothers go with their kids there, teenagers go for their dates and, you know, basically hanging out friends and the old people go there to walk and to also to socialize. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it's interesting to, to think about comparisons between sprawl and suburbia in uh, Europe and, mm -hmm. in, uh, and in America. Um, as I said, many of the, American, of the American models have been transplanted uh, kind of almost blindly uh, mm -hmm. to Europe. Um, however, if you think about it, you know, suburbia, so the suburban model was imported to the United States from Hugh Hampstead and Welwyn and uh, Ledgeworth, you know, as the first, the first <laughs> yeah. suburbs. Um, and they were made with a good intention that yeah. you know you create, but you create places which are whole or sustainable mm. in their own right because they are accessible by uh, transportation, mm -hmm. by uh, by transit. Yeah. Uh, but then when the transportation changed in the United States with the big highways, then the pattern totally was mm -hmm. blown out. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the very important element which we as new urbanists insist on bringing up to the table is the neighborhood unit. You know, that when you, when you have the neighborhood unit or the walkability pedestrian shed, which is the physicality of a, of a community, you know, mm. you can walk five to ten minutes, you know, usually we say, if you have all the things you, you need for your daily life within this walking distance, 
then this is a real neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Barcelona, Barcelona is probably overlapping pedestrian sheds with the American type of sprawl uh, can be observed, the, basically the disintegration of the neighborhood unit. Mm -hmm. And I usually make, um, and in my book, the Sprawl Repair Manual, I make uh, the distinction between sprawl and suburbia. Mm -hmm. Because suburbs, even in the popular consciousness, are not a bad word. It, it's not like it's not a bad connotation. You know, mm -hmm. suburbs are basically the places which are outside of the city dense city, and they can be still good places. They were done initially, as as we uh, started talking about mm -hmm. them. They were done with a good intention of a place which is uh, self sustainable mm -hmm. and still walkable. And the first ones which were built in the United States, they were this type because they were done on the railroads or the streetcars or there were streetcar neighborhoods or um, around stations mm -hmm. and people didn't have cars, they had to walk around everywhere. Mm -hmm. So they were still based on the neighborhood unit. And then after the Second World War with the car becoming a very democratic, um, a democratic uh, tool for movement everywhere, mm -hmm. a tool of freedom then, you know, these distances didn't matter anymore, so they were kind of blown out of proportion. This sprawl was born with more or less around the time of Levittown, yes, you know, yeah. in the late 40s. We expected a lot when we came. We had an awful lot of hope. We were all young couples and just starting a family. You come here expecting to build a life. and. And that is the most important thing in life, is to the family and building a home. There was lines waiting to sign up for homes. They were buying homes that weren't there yet. Just a stick in the ground, that's all, with a number on it. That's what we were here for, is to start a life afresh with no war. But the bell-bottom blues cause my sweetie is a sailor and he's sailing. This was where slices of the American dream were plentiful and cheap. All of this was the brainchild of one man, the developer, William Levitt. I was dancing with my darling. Levitt Town began in 1952. Truman was president. Patty Page on top of the music charts. I happen to see and sprawling Pennsylvania farmlands vanished in a burst of construction. Entire homes were built in rapid succession. Families moved in almost right away. Got a house and a car and a wedding ring. To me, it was the fastest growth of a community that allowed it to be, look as though it had been there a long time. Bring a little love into my life. It was kind of hectic, but well controlled. And it went on seven days a week, actually 24 hours a day, because I've seen guys put roofs on at night on their lights. There was no infrastructure. There was nothing. It was a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people, coming in to one great big pot. This is it, my hometown. The place we as members of this community call home... Levitt devised a handful of house models to fit any budget. There was the Levittowner model, the most affordable of the choices. If you had a bit more cash, you could go for a Jubilee-style home. War veterans and their families were given special deals. And all we had to do was put $100 down, sight unseen, but it was still a concrete block with uh, the heater in the middle. And it took three months for our house to be built. Everything was built from scratch to make life easy, from the careful placement of churches and shopping centers to home furnishings. They came complete with everything. Everything we needed was right there. From mailboxes, all the appliances were in the kitchen, to trash cans, to bathrooms, curtains. Everything was landscaped, so it was perfect. I mean, it was a fabulous deal. Mm -hmm. 
different. So there is the difference. That's why I differentiate. And I called yeah. the book Sprawl Repair Manual because I wanted to yeah, the sprawl, yeah. pay attention mm. specifically to sprawl, you know, yeah. to these patterns which are car oriented. You know, suburbs can be pedestrian oriented, they can be mm. human scale, while sprawl is usually when it's really auto centered mm. and you have yes. segregation of different uses. Mm. So this is the, the, the big difference. Mm. Ahora otra cosa, en los Estados Unidos, para que entiendan eso de por qué el nuevo urbanismo siempre, o sea, el nuevo urbanismo es como un estilo eh, bien, bien feo, eh, o sea, ¿no? y bien pobre. Eh, y la, la razón eh, de eso es una razón económica y de, y de mercadeo. Porque el americano, el americano que, que acepta arquitectura moderna en cualquier cosa menos en su casa. Su casa tiene que ser completamente tradicional. O sea, ellos han, ellos han, o sea, la si miran la, la evolución de la casa americana, o sea, las cositas que han cambiado son bastante eh, pocas. O sea, el garaje quizás ha sido incorporado dentro de la casa, la cocina es diferente, o sea, ahorita hay una cocina que no tiene eh, murallas, ¿no? Y que uno puede ver televisión mientras está cocinando y cosas así, ¿no? Bueno, ahorita no hay familias tradicionales. Claro, claro. Para ah, ahorita, nosotros claro. hemos hecho un, un recuento aquí y 75% de la familia americana no es tradicional. Y eso significa familias extendidas, o sea, familias que viven con los padres, familias que viven con los abuelos, madres solteras, hombres solteros, gente que vive sola y eso es una familia. If we want to retrofit, if we want to repair, mm. we need to be as aggressive and as conscious as with buildings pro. And it will take probably as many generations mm. to rebuild yeah. as it took us to, to build pro. Yeah. Yeah. And it will probably not going to be everything. You know, it's not going to be possible. At least in the United States, we have so much of it that even now with the recent crisis, we notice that on the fringes, you know, the ex-urban developments, there are many which will be probably deserted, either totally abandoned to mm -hmm. become nature or to be converted into agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now they're like zombie subdiv subdivisions, you know. Most of the foreclosures, mm -hmm. most of the big uh, mortgage defaults happened mm -hmm. actually on the ex in the excerpts. Yeah. And this was because the people who couldn't afford to live closer, they were driving and driving and driving till they qualify for a mortgage. So basically the far-fetched, the furthest away uh, suburbs, they suffered the most. You know, mm. And there are studies from uh, North Carolina, from uh, California, from Florida even, you know, showing these numbers. That's why the tools for retrofit or for repair need to be on all fronts. We need to be very good designers to be able to design, you know, to, to show how to um, reweave the fabric of the, of the suburbs, you know, how to create connectivity to make everything walkable, from car-oriented to make it walkable and pedestrian-friendly. Mm -hmm. This is a big challenge. Yeah. And, you, you, in, and also to build on the assets which are there, because we have a lot of infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of buildings which are still existing. We can reuse, we can recycle, we can re-inhabit, you know, adapt many of these spaces, reuse them. You know, we cannot be wasteful and say, we're going to start over, let's tear it down, as it used to be in the 60s in the urban renewal. This will be much more subtle and much more opportunistic redevelopment. You know, we'll be going and doing things very, uh, uh, in a much more um, surgical manner. But then there are two others, you know, one is the... Uh, policy and regulatory framework. Are our laws, are, 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 are our codes prepared to uh, basically accept these new, uh, new changes? And so far it has, they have not been. Our regulations basically do not allow for these walkable and uh, you know, compact patterns to happen. So we need to change that. We need to change the operating system mm. of our way we build cities and towns and places. 
And uh, luckily, you know, the New Urbanists as a movement, we have a long history of uh, experience mm -hmm. of doing that. You know, we have realized a long time ago that actually the codes, coding things, changing the genetic material of the places we built is very important. Mm. And we have seen this actually from, from history. You know, there are places where they're built in a way because there were rules which were followed. And you look at Paris, you look at London, I'm sure there were rules in Madrid and Barcelona yeah. uh, where you know certain things happen the way they are because there were rules which yeah. are written. So now we have to change the rules back to, to, to normal, to human scale hmm. uh, settlements not only for the car, you know, with a very wide streets, with very mm. fast movement, with the highways, limited uh, infrastructure only for the cars, you know, not the kind of the very fine grain of mm. pedestrian uh, environment, you know, the small blocks and the smaller buildings uh, and all of these things which are very important for um, mm. pedestrian movement mm. in general. And then the third component, which is also very, very important, is, is the implementation or the financing, or how we pay for all of this. Um, and this is like the big question today. You know, today we have this economy which is everywhere. There is not a country which is not affected. You know, everybody's on a fast path of economic growth, but sooner or later there is slowing yeah. down. So the more incremental approach, maybe mm. doing little smaller things mm. in certain places, maybe the very sensible. And because we're not going to have very large projects, especially in the developed world, you know, like uh, in the United States and to very high extent uh, in Europe, including Spain, we just don't have that much greenfield to develop anymore, you know, unless we want to squander our remaining agricultural land, <laughs> which is, you know, in Europe is even worse, you know, in America many people say, oh, why are you afraid? You have, if you put all of your built stuff together, you have probably only 5% of your surface built, built out, yeah. you know, but if you think about it, how we are spread in the areas which are best for building, yeah, yeah. then you will see that we don't have that much land no. left, you know, some of our best cities actually were, were uh, done on, uh, on land which was drained swamps or lowlands, you know, New Orleans and Boston mm -hmm. and Washington, our capital, you know, was in the swampland, mm -hmm. so if you think about it, some of the best, the best grounds are already yeah. Occupy, yeah. but today because of this economy we are in a much uh, kind of worse situation because we are poorer. There is not uh, this flow of capital as it used to be into the development real estate industry. So we have to be much smarter mm -hmm. uh, where yeah. to grow, how to grow, what to do. And um, our sprawling communities actually come uh, come as a very viable place to to do changes. Um, we know that our cities, especially in the United States, in Europe is different because your cities are still in good shape, you know, yeah. and they're still holding probably the highest real estate values in the city, yeah. within the city, yes. in the best places, the historical places, while the American city is a different paradigm, mm. you know, which is a kind of the, the donut effect, yeah. you know, basically the center city is emptied out and the suburbs are the rich, the, where the rich uh, people uh, moved out. However, even this paradigm is changing. Today, mm -hmm. there is the, the big, uh, you can read in the mm -hmm. media and everywhere, uh, about the big renaissance of the American city. You know, everybody is returning to the inner neighborhoods and to the more urban areas. Yeah. Uh, while a lot of the immigrants, the kind of the first generation immigrants, are going to the, to the suburbs. Because there are areas, you know, around the first and second a tier of suburbs where they're becoming more impoverished, you know, and poorer. Mm -hmm. uh, so even the demographics of the suburbs is changing. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. So that's another uh, kind of uh, uh, shift. Uh, they are sometimes called uh, ethnoburbs because there are so many ethnic mm -hmm. diversity there. It's not like the um, stereotype of the white middle class family with a several with a couple of kids, you know, and with a car. And this is changing. You know, they're bigger families and they need different, they have different needs. There are many young people who are there, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, whose families moved from other places. And these people have maybe, are in their previous lives, they were accustomed to different way of life, you know, mm -hmm. walking more. So you can go and you can see many places around uh, 
Atlanta and in uh, uh, even in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I was mm -hmm. recently an eyewitness in some of the cul-de-sacs of the suburban uh, enclaves in uh, around Phoenix. You see uh, basically um, spontaneous market markets, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, happening in the cul-de-sac. These are the ways people people live, and they uh, create a kind of a second economy, if you mm -hmm. wish. You know, artisan yeah. artisan type of uh, living. You know, they make things, or they exchange things, or they they just sell things and yeah. buy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, or you know, if you look at some of the shopping centers around around cities, um, many ethnic small restaurants pop out, and little businesses and there is a vitality in these places which mm. is uh, interesting to look at and maybe to accommodate in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we as architects have to be very careful in um, architects and planners, you know, mm -hmm. very careful in uh, observing uh, these tendencies, how people live, what we will be building and designing and for whom. Mm -hmm. It's not only just to create things and say, okay, this is like an empty parking lot, let's fill it in with buildings because it's better but we need we need to know what the market is in their training courses held around the country NCI teaches professionals and community leaders how to prepare for and conduct intense collaborative planning events called charrettes. It's kind of a combination between a New England town meeting and a barn raising. The energy and excitement behind a traditional barn raising is that everybody is involved in the creation of something and you need everybody to play their role strongly to create this barn. And at the end it's an amazing community building event. A charrette is not just a one-day workshop. It's a high-energy, multiple-day planning event where everyone has a voice in the process. I like to see stop signs. I like to see little islands sticking out. The NCI charrette system can be applied to all types of planning projects. The NCI charrette system can also revive aging inner-city neighborhoods. East Fort Myers, Florida is counting on that. The challenges here are ideally suited for a charrette. We need ambitious and visionary plans. We need plans that will inspire people. The town planning firm of Dover Coal and Partners is about to put the NCI charrette system to work in East Fort Myers. This charrette preparation phase is perhaps the most important part of the process. It can take from six weeks to nine months before the charrette and includes a rigorous project assessment, stakeholder education, base data research, and charrette logistics. This helps to ensure that the right information and the right people are available for a successful outcome. This intense period is one in which we bring together all kinds of um, information and people ex with expertise and the public and authorities and decision makers and uh, we put them all into the mix and work it out together. At the kickoff that evening, the team talks about the upcoming design workshop and how neighbors can have a hand in creating a new and improved place to live and work. The truth is, if y'all don't believe in the plan, it won't get implemented. The best plans are made by many hands. The best accountability process you can implement is the one where you are with us as we go. Thank you for all attending tonight. The next morning, concerned citizens take a chance and turn out for the hands-on workshop. Rather than showing little bits of hodgepodge progress, each person will weigh in with their best ideas on how to make their neighborhood a better place. You can Without any new construction. If you get it turned over, you can immediately put it to use. That's magnetic, and they, they don't want to go home. A world of different ideas, and yet some common themes emerge. Desire for a safer community, walkable, livable neighborhoods, and new quality development. Thank you once again for attending, and we can't wait to see you at the Work in Progress presentation. It was fun, it was challenging, exciting at times. It was, uh, it was, it was a good debate. 
When the workshop ends, it's back to the design studio, where the team begins reviewing table drawings and synthesizing ideas from citizens. The charrette team is now into their fourth day and making steady progress. Where we like to introduce like a little commercial mixed use park. Across the room, police talk about crime. City staff weigh in on housing, code enforcement, and economics. This is part of the first feedback loop with city staff and community members. Feedback loops give stakeholders the chance to continually review the evolving plan and offer instant feedback to the team. Charrettes last at least four days, sometimes more, in order to accomplish three feedback loops. Because of its complexity, the East Fort Myers Charrette will be seven days long. Repeatedly every day, um, some pre a presentation of ideas is made, there's a reaction, people go back to work, present it again the next day with having incorporated the comments of the prior day. And that's indeed one of the reasons you need the length of time because you need that kind of uh, returning of ideas, the feedback loop, to ensure the best result. It's a transparent process. As the concepts take shape, designers add color and they're scanned into computers. Day seven, the final day of the charrette. The design team prepares for the evening's work in progress presentation to the public. Even the best plans can't help if they're never implemented. A key to success will be maintaining momentum. A good strategy helps too. The final plan will feature a menu of improvements and a detailed course of action, from zoning and code changes to funding solutions. That evening, anxious citizens file into council chambers. The mayor quickly hands the reins over to the Charette team. They begin to present the comprehensive and detailed set of plans and policies that have been created over the last week. You can have growth and change that makes things better rather than worse. In fact, you should demand it and accept nothing less. The team shows how dated shopping centers can be transformed into walkable town centers, how good design can create safer and better housing. They offer a plan for more parks and gardens, and they show where more dense development could be an asset to the community. Finally, the jewel of East Fort Myers, the Caloosahatchee River, is to be celebrated. A public promenade along the riverfront would give citizens access and a new point of pride, an exciting place to live, shop, and dine. A few highlights of a very detailed plan. Thank you all very much. A roadmap to a better life. I thought it was fabulous. I mean, there's a lot of great ideas. They heard us loud and clear. They, they were listening. Do I love all of it? No but it, I think it's a good start. This wasn't just a bunch of pretty watercolors, but there were reasons and explanations behind everything that they did. I am very positive that we're going to have a very good change for the benefit of everybody here in Fort Myers. The charrette is usually the most efficient way. The most efficient way, and it's, uh, we have uh, found uh, time and time again that um, there is nothing like uh, concentrating human energy and human energy by many, many people mm. in on one project, on one, on one site. And here in the United States, because there was so much disappointment with, the, with growth and the way things developed with sprawl and everybody has traffic in front of their houses mm. and it's impossible and nobody wants any more development near mm -hmm. them, though they're there but they don't want anybody else to be there. Uh, for every project now we have, we have to have public process. Mm -hmm. And the public process, the best way is to have a charrette because this is the way we can actually project and educate, you know, tell them, look, we are going to be part of your solution, you know, yeah. not the part of the problem of traffic. Actually, we're trying to help you yeah. and show different ways of the previous way, in contrast to the previous way. Mm -hmm. So in America, there are no projects which are not done with charrette. This has become uh, the staple of, uh, of any kind of project, you know, whether public or private. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the public uh, projects, you know, municipal work from cities, they always do charrettes. They, it's like almost a requirement in the request for proposals. Mm -hmm. And the private sector, very rarely they opt out of a charrette. They like the charrette because they have seen it very 
as a very effective tool. Incremental change es cómo producir cambios sin perturbar, o sea, sin tener que demoler todo, sino cómo producir los cambios poco a poco. Los big boxes no se van a ir de ahí, pero los big boxes son feos por fuera. Lo que hay que hacer es añadirles por, por, por afuera lo que le dice liner buildings, de edificios existentes, sí. añadirles una línea de, de más edificios que tengan vivienda arriba y retail abajo ¿sí? o oficinas claro. o lo que fuera entonces todavía está el big box ahí pero uno no lo ve ¿sí? uh -huh. o sea, es parte de la, de la estructura urbana uh -huh. es algo que no se va a ir y de todo eso después él agarra por ejemplo estos shopping centers y empieza a mirar por dónde los puede partir para poder hacer bloques ¿sí? uh -huh. entonces incrementalmente muestra cómo puede uno ir desde A hasta Z, o sea, cómo puede ir uno de lo que es malísimo a lo que ellos consideran que es el ideal. Um, well, I mean, here we have many different examples. There is one example which is actually here in Florida. I mean, here in Miami, uh, in. Uh, It's called Downtown Kendall, mm -hmm. which is an edge city mm -hmm. retrofit, yeah. which is basically a triangle uh, of land, a uh, fairly large one, which was a, a mall. But it's an example how um, you can rebalance you know, the shopping with other activities, like mm -hmm. with, with the residential, and mm -hmm. it's on a transit line. So it becomes like a, a, down, a downtown for the lower density neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. the site. Um, downtown Atlanta is right over here, you know, it, so it's about two miles from the site over, it's off the picture here, but downtown Atlanta is over here. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the major highways that leads out of downtown. A lot of existing neighborhoods, this is all, all existing neighborhoods, and the site right here at the main intersection was originally an industrial site. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a spot where they were uh, recycling concrete. They would take old concrete and, and crush it up and make it into road beds and things, so it was uh, okay. originally, but it had gone vacant, there was nothing on the site um, when, we, when we began the project. And so the idea was, because it's such a good location right at, at, main, at main intersection and with a lot of existing residential around, the thought was to do a mixed-use project here mm -hmm. that could be a center for this whole area. Yeah. And so people here could come to the center to shop um, and to, to have offices and that sort of thing. And so the idea was to create a lot of diversity in mm -hmm. the site. And so within this small area, you can see the, the, these colored lots are basically uh, single-family houses. The existing neighborhood over here is single-family, and mm -hmm. so for political purposes, it was useful to, to have single-family close to that single-family, mm -hmm. so that neighbors aren't upset about Because in America, it's difficult oftentimes mm -hmm. to, to do more dense things close to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, kind of a transition. Most of this gray is actually townhouses. So this, this picture. Yeah. So once you get past the single family, we start to, it started to introduce more of these more dense kinds of building types mm -hmm. um, to make it more of a center. And so this is actually one of the public squares. This is this space. And so you can see the townhouses on this side yeah. are designed so that they could even have commercial on the ground floor. You could have retail on the ground mm -hmm. floor. And this is this little park you can see with the trees and things, and there's benches. This is actually this little space right mm -hmm. here. And then um, transitioning to the corner over here is more uh, intense mixed use building. Mm -hmm. And so here again is that existing neighborhood. And you can see the idea of the single family houses up here. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we did differently, these single family houses have the parking from the front. And so as you go down the street in, in this neighborhood, you see garage doors, mm -hmm. but we added the alleys in the back for, yeah. for this. So, so when you go down the street, it looks very good actually. You just see the, the front porches. And then, so the idea is that the next street over, you can see is row houses on both sides of the street. So it gets a little more dense. This is single family on both sides. This is row houses on both sides, so attached, attached together. Looks a little bit like that again. 
And then as you get to the corner, you can see these more intense kind of downtown mixed-use buildings. This one, in this particular project, um, the developer was very particular about the designs. They, they were interested in the, in the design of the buildings. Actually, when we were doing the rendering, the, the drawings for the buildings, yeah. they were looking at the building details, and it, you can tell that they were uh, trying to fine-tune the design that they actually wanted to build using the renderings. And so they asked for a lot of changes to the renderings mm -hmm. so that they okay. could, so could fine-tune things. Um, and their idea was, was for a lot, of the, a lot of the buildings, they wanted to replicate the, the kinds of structures that you see in Atlanta. Especially one of the things they really liked about Atlanta was they have some beautiful um, industrial, old historic industrial buildings. Mm -hmm. So they have a, yeah, they, so they have this kind of a feel. They have a kind of a strength to them, mm -hmm. but they have some beautiful detailing too. Um, but the, the detailing tends to be pretty simple and straightforward. But, but very nice, you know, you have a nice cornice at the top and a nice nice proportions to the windows. Mm -hmm. But not, not too fancy, but at the same time with a lot of warmth to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of it is, is kind of is the brick architecture with, with limestone yeah. um, details around the windows, this sort of thing. And so they really wanted to try that. Um, and then there's a little bit of freedom in terms of modern versus more traditional. Yeah, this they, the same park, they, the way they designed it, it has a playground at this end. Yeah. And then open grass oh, field yeah. at this end. And then there's actually a waterway that runs through on this end. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually wonderful because it functions as a public space. You can see the events. But at the same time, it actually helps to treat stormwater. Oh, yeah. And so rain falls and the water runs across this grass and helps to clean it up before it goes down into the, into the waterway. So they, it has two, two functions. The original design, this is actually a school oh. in this corner. Um, it turned out, though, um, after talking with the local school board, that they have an existing school close enough by that they decided that they, after after examining it for a long time, they decided they didn't want to build a second school connection. So mm -hmm. um, this side, there's a there's a, a couple of connections you can see actually in the plan there. Yeah. There's two street connections off of this street, and then this is a highway, so unfortunately yeah. no connections <laughs> there. But but uh, this mm -hmm. is a major connection that leads up to downtown, mm -hmm. and so once you come across, there's multiple street connections here, and then multiple street connections on this side also. And so every spot that it's possible to connect, we connect it as much as we could. That's often a challenge, trying to, trying to figure out ways to connect, to, especially with existing neighborhoods. Sometimes an existing neighborhood is very resistant. Yeah. Um, here, I think they were so interested in being able to get to the commercial and to the, some of the services. And the, I think also one thing that was helpful was that our project was closer to the main intersection. And so if it had been the other way around, if they yeah. were close to the intersection, they would think that our residents had to pass through their neighborhood, but here they had just the opportunity to take a shortcut to the yeah, intersection. Yeah. So it was good for them. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we got the connections.